Here we go. All right. So here we have the 2017, one of the more difficult AP World EBQs uh, that they uh, that they have ever come up with. Um, now the other thing is that uh, this is also the last DBQ that went before the current DBQ structure of only doing 1200 to now. So this one goes all the way back to 600 BCE. Um, I don't know why this person gave this one to me. It's kind of, I told them not to do any of the old DBQs, but whatever. All right, so it is uh, the 57 mark. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Of course, we're going to take our 15 minutes to plan. Uh, okay, let's see. <clears throat> so our thesis here, evaluate the extent to which religious responses to wealth accumulation uh, in Eurasia, so it's Europe and Asia, 600 to 15 so that's a thousand year period that's a lot that's a long time period so we have europe and asia already a huge place 1000 years already a huge time period and state versus uh religion so we've got like three to four different <laughs> potential <laughs> we're talking three to four different variables here this is crazy um but let's go ahead and let's take a look um before i read the documents of course i'm trying to think of what i know about state and wealth accumulation uh i know that a lot of empires really like to trade right we have empires such as uh the mongols which do fall in this time period protecting the silk road that's the big one mongols on the silk road that could be an example of a state response um most religions are somewhat anti-wealth accumulation so i know that but i also know that for example the religion of islam their prophet was a merchant um he he was a merchant before he had his divine revelation so that could be a piece of outside evidence i could use uh, it's always good to kind of brainstorm these things before you go dive in deep into the documents because you might get tunnel vision and then you forget everything you you know that you already know in this big massive brain that you have uh between your shoulders so let's give it a look Let's see. Document number one. We have the Chronicles of Zhu. I think Zhu. I don't think that's Zhao. I think it's Zhu. Uh, early Chinese historical work during the Warring States period. Okay. The Warring States period. Uh, 350 BC. Okay. That's pretty early in our thousand year framework. Um, an ambassador from a Chinese state desired a jade ring that belonged to a merchant. So the ambassador begged the official to have the ring confiscated from the merchant and given to him. However, this uh, official refused, saying our ancient rulers made a pact with the merchants in our state that will last through the generations. If you do not revolt against me, I will not violently interfere with your commerce. I love that, violently interfere, right? I'm not just going to interfere. I'm going to violently interfere. Violently. Um, that's hilarious. I will not beg or take anything of you, and then you may have your profitable markets, precious things, and substance without my taking any knowledge of them. Um, so basically, we're not going to interfere. Um, okay, so this is like the state will allow merchants to accumulate uh, wealth, right? Although it's interesting because... It's interesting because it doesn't seem like they're getting anything in return here. That's one of the things um, that I'm noticing. The state won't interfere. But, of course, they don't seem to be getting anything in return. So that's a little sus, but... Um, okay, all the same. Let's let's keep looking. Chanankya, uh, advisor to the first Mauryan emperor. Oh, that would be not Ashoka, but his, his, grand, his father... Artha Shastra. Oh, you know what? I've heard of this. I, I've heard of this book. I haven't read it, but I have heard of it. I know this because um, I was on a field trip and we had a, a chaperone who was uh, an older an older gentleman from South Asia. And I told him I teach history. And he's like, oh, have you read the Artha Shastra? And I was like, no, I haven't heard of it. He's like, you should, you should read it. It's from ancient India. And I said, okay. I still haven't read it, but that name sounds familiar. Um... So same time period, uh, 250 BCE. Uh, Superintendent of Commerce shall monitor demands and the changing prices of various kinds of merchandise, both domestically uh, produced and brought from other countries. He shall determine the time suitable for the distribution, purchase, and sale of various kinds of merchandise. He shall avoid setting prices to allow large profits to harm the people. 
All those who sell merchandise shall submit to the superintendent their sale reports saying this much has been sold, this much remains. Interesting. So this there's a position that fixes the price. So this is a position that fixes the price but also allows for profits. So this is a little bit different than that first document. They're talking about allowing for some kind of profit. Um, this is an active role too, right? This isn't just passive. This is an active government role. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Huh. All right. What do we got? Document three, a Roman statesman and philosopher. Okay. A statesman and philosopher. We generally accept as true the following statements about trade and occupations in regards to which are suitable for gentlemen and which are vulgar. Oh, so these are the kinds of jobs you can have. Uh, those occupations are condemned, which bring upon you people's hatred, such as tax collecting and money lending. Uh, hired workmen. So tax collection, being a day laborer, um, and a merchant. Okay, so three terrible jobs, according to the Roman Empire are to be a, a laborer, a tax collector, or a merchant, right? Agriculture is good. So this is sort of an anti-wealth accumulation statement, right? Anti-wealth, right? Saying that wealth is bad. You shouldn't accumulate this. Um, what's the best form of property ownership? He replies, raising livestock with great success, raising livestock with little success, and then raising crops. <clears throat> and when asked about money lending, he said, what about murder? Murder. I like that. That's a funny comparison. Money lending equals murder. Money lending is bad, yo. I'm going to adjust my microphone really quick. Whoop. Whoop. There we go. Money lending is bad. All right. What else we got? Uh, we got a monk. Okay. So we got some state documents. Now let's look at some religious documents. Um, the life of Melania, Melania, Melania. Now that sounds familiar. Do we know someone named Melania? I think we do. Melania the Younger, a uh, saint. Oh, this is a saint person. The blessed Melania and her husband both came from Roman families of senatorial rank. So they're really high up in the social hierarchy, but abandoned their frivolous and worldly mode of life, experienced an angelic heavenly purpose. They left Rome and they went to their suburban estate where they devoted themselves to the practice of the virtues um, they made themselves enemies of wealthy life. So this is a religious couple that left all of their wealth. Um, it was an extraordinary piece of property, and it stood a bath that surpassed worldly splendor. The estate had 62 settlements within its borders and 400 slaves. <clears throat> but the devil gave me these things. So the blessed ones fearlessly gave away all their possessions, which were enough for the entire world. They established monasteries of monks and nuns, furnishing each place with a sufficient amount of gold. They resented their numerous expensive silk cloths at the altars of churches and made many offerings to God. So this person who was wealthy gave away their money to the, alt to the churches, and that was good. So I, it seems like it's saying that wealth is okay as long as you give it away. That seems to be the vibe I'm getting here. Um, it also is probably worth noting that these people were probably converts, although actually by 450, most people in the Roman Empire were Christians, so they might not have been converts. They could have just been born Christians. Um, also worth noting that this is a, about... The, the Roman Empire was not doing well around this time. It, it's, its official end is about 20 years after this, but things weren't great <laughs> for the Roman Empire. So it's also worth noting that perhaps these people were really uh, conscious of their bad like time to be alive. They were conscious of the political decline all around them. I mean, that could be, that could be kind of feeding into their desire to give everything away. Who knows? Um, oh, let's see, the Quran. Oh, let's see what we got here. <clears throat> O you who believe, spend on others out of good things you may have acquired, and out of that which God brings forth to you from the earth, and choose not for your charity things which you yourself would not want or accept without averting your eyes in disdain. The devil threatens you with the prospect of poverty and bids you to be stingy, but God is infinite, all-knowing, and granting of wisdom unto whom he wills. 
Whatever you may spend on others or vow to spend, God knows it. And those who do wrong by withholding charity shall have no one to comfort them. If you do deeds of charity openly, it is well. But if you throw it upon the needy in secret, it will be even better for you. And it will atone for some of your bad deeds. Hmm. So charity is good. I mean, this is a lot of religions agree on this. Charity is good. Speaking of charity, hey, consider donating. Got the donation bar down there. Uh, QR code right above my head. Um, cool. Uh, but if you still vote on the needy in secret, it'll be even better for you. Interesting. So if you give, that's good. So giving is good. It also doesn't say you can't accumulate wealth, right? It says you can. Uh, uh, it says you can accumulate wealth. That's fine. You know, wealth accumulation is okay, uh, provided that you give it away. Again, kind of this whole give it away thing. Right. I'm also reminded of the fact that in Islam, there's this thing called, um, I think it's, is it zakat? I believe it is zakat. Right? Zakat, the, the mandatory uh, um, charity tax. Right? That could be a piece of outside information. Um, cool. Document six. What have we got here? Uh, oh, oh, this is a beautiful tapestry. Painting from a Buddhist cave at Beziklik. <clears throat> Biziklik, Biziklik, Central Asia, 800 CE. Painting shows the Buddha and Bodhisattva's blessing Central Asian traders bearing gifts for the Biziklik temples. So basically, give to the temples and you will be blessed by the Buddha himself and his, uh, the most, the most, you know, holy people on earth. Yes, Guardian, that was incredibly smooth. Exacto mundo. Right, so let's see, we've got the Bodhisattvas up here, and the merchants down here giving gifts. Also merchants of every, like that's a, that's interesting. So this merchant here on the right, this is a Sogdian, and this merchant here on the left looks Chinese, or he's wearing a hat that indicates he might be from that part of the world. Interesting. Interesting. So, again, it sounds like if you give to religious endowments, you're going to be good, right? You give to religious endowments, you'll be fine. Religious endowments. Right, you're going to go ahead and be A-OK -okay, uh, if you give to religious endowments. So I'm sensing a serious, I'm sensing a pattern here. <laughs> I'm sensing a pattern, at least with the religious uh, responses to, to wealth. Um, let's see, last document. Ganapatideva, Ganapatideva, I think. Ganapatideva, ruler of the South Indian Kakit. Kakatiya State, Edict circa 1245. The glorious king uh, issues the following edict to assure safety has been granted to sea traders starting from and arriving from all continents. Formerly, kings used to take away by force the whole cargo carried by ships and vessels, which after they had started from one country were attacked by storm and wrecked ashore. But we, out of mercy, hereby pledge to leave everything except a fixed duty. With a thought that wealth is more valuable than even life. Oh, because people take great risks to go on sea voyages. The thought that wealth is even better than life. The rate of this duty is one thirteenth. Okay, so again, we have a state that's sort of just like, hey, we'll only take a little bit, right? A fixed duty. Okay. Okay, so let's see. We've got about three more minutes of planning. So what do we got here? Um... Huh. Okay, so if the question is <clears throat> the difference between how much, how different are the states to the religions, I would say not very much. But what angles do we have to analyze that from? Well, religions, t it, it seems like from what we've seen, religions tended to say something to the effect of it's okay to have wealth as long as you give it away. Wealth itself is not good unless you do something positive with it. That seems to be the religious position, which should surprise nobody. Um, shouldn't really surprise. That, that you know, religions tend to be about, you know, charity and doing good works. Um, so the response of religion seems to be wealth. Here, I'm actually going to switch over to the document so I can, you can see my kind of, I'm going to type out my thought process here. <clears throat> Let's see. Um... Okay. Uh, 
Okay, so let me zoom in also so you can see. So wealth accumulation religions say okay, uh, but you have to give it away. Whereas states also say okay, but you also have to pay your taxes. But then not all of the states are saying okay, because we saw that Roman document. And that Roman document was like, money lending is bad and merchant accumulation is bad. So it's not always the case that wealth accumulation is good in the eyes of these states. Um, but where's the distinction there? What's the distinction we can draw? Um, I wonder, hang on. So the Roman Empire said that wealth is murder, wealth accumulation is bad. Um, oh, you know what? You know what? I think, let's see. I think excessive. We, you know what we could say? Sort of a similarity that they both have are the states are opposed to excessive profits, right? Excessive wealth accumulation, right? And I think we can make this case because both documents, uh, number two and number four, or sorry, um, number three, the Roman one, but also here, I'll show you. Uh, the Roman document, but also the uh, also the one from uh, India. That one also talks about. So, right here we go. Uh, the superintendent of commerce shall monitor the demands and the changing prices of merchandise, both domestically produced and brought from other countries. He shall determine the time it's suitable for distribution, purchase, sale of kinds of merchandise. He shall avoid setting prices that allow for such large profits as to harm the people, right? <clears throat> that sounds like an opposition to excessive wealth accumulation. Not saying that you can't have a profit, right? But you can't harm the people. Now, of course, that's not the same as saying that it's bad to be a money lender or a merchant, right? Which is what this one says down here, or at least is implying. But I think there is a degree of similarity here that we can kind of put these together in a group and talk about them in similar terms, right? Which again, when you look at these documents, when you're a student on the actual exam on the day of, you're just gonna have to make kind of a call on this stuff. But the idea is we wanna try to find documents of a similar nature so that we can kind of put them together and uh, you know, kind of make it work. So um, states are not opposed to, and they talk about taxation. Um, document one hints at that, though it doesn't say it outright. And document seven also discusses a, a fixed duty. And then all the religious documents are kind of all the same on this front. So that would be four, five, and six. All pretty much say the same thing, which is, uh, you know, wealth is good, but give it away. You know, just g give it away, accumulate it, but give it away. It's your religious obligation um, to give away wealth. So with that said, um, let's use the phrasing of the document as always. Uh, let's see. And the words the document used, the words that the prompt used, we will just rephrase it easily. So if the prompt says, evaluate the extent to which religious responses to wealth accumulation differed from state responses to wealth accumulation, then let's just use that phrasing. So between the time period, actually, that's really quick, thesis. Between the time period 600 BCE and 1500 CE, states and religions differed subtly in their responses to wealth accumulation in the degree that both states and religions let's see both states and religions did not oppose wealth accumulation provided that 
it was given away by religious peoples or that taxes were paid by merchants in India. I'd say uh, religious people in Islam or the taxes were paid by merchants in India. However, states were opposed to excessive taxation. Or, sorry, opposed to excessive wealth accumulation. Were opposed to excessive wealth accumulation by merchants. Right? Cool. So there we have, uh, as is seen in the Roman Empire. <clears throat> Dope. Okay. So we got 20 minutes down, 40 minutes to go. Awesome. Okay. Um, that's our thesis. Uh, let's contextualize this a little bit. Actually, you know what? Let's... Let's do context a little bit later. Let's just sort of, let's just jump into it. Um, we can do context later. Let's go ahead and uh, jump right into it. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the uh, religious position on wealth. And this is probably going to be the longest paragraph as it is three whole documents, three entire documents. So religions responded, whoops, let me scroll down real quick. Responded to state accumulation of wealth by, or sorry, not state, what am I talking about? <laughs> Started to individual accumulation of wealth by dictating its distribution to those in need, right? Right, to those individuals or in those in need individuals or institutions right that's by the way a fine distinction you can see between the the buddhist and christian documents and the quote from the quran is that those first two documents are talking about supporting religious institutions uh whereas the quran one is only talking about supporting individuals right helping people in need so <clears throat> um Let's see, for example, a story of an early Christian saint named Melania, Melania, <laughs> uh, describes her giving away great amounts of wealth. Right, so we have this description here. Uh, uh, I believe that's document four. All right, so we there we have our little description. Let's check in my notes here. Yes, that's uh, right. That's there. So the document describes the document makes an explicit connection between holding on to wealth and being condemned for eternity <laughs> by the evil forces of the universe, but does not condemn the act of gaining said wealth. Right? So we're, again, we're not condemning the fact that she was rich, right? The fact that she was rich and that her family had gained all this wealth is not a bad thing. Although it was bad if they had held on to it. So that they gave it away um, was the good thing, right? And then if we look at similarly in document, in document, uh, similarly, a passage from the Quran. I think that's got to have an apostrophe in the middle. Oh, no. So, no, no second day. Um, <clears throat> similarly, a passage from the Quran describes 
how one can make up for bad deeds via the work of private charity, right? Via the work of private charity. I'm also realizing that that analysis for that first document is not terribly, um, not terribly nuanced. So I'm going to go back and fix that in a second. Uh, in particular, this was a major part of the religion of Islam, which institutionalized charity for the poor in the form of a tax on wealth known as zakat. I actually don't know if it's a tax individually on wealth, um, but it is a tax on something, right? So let me go back really quick and fix this. Um, hold on. This means that one can accumulate wealth as long as one recognizes its proper use is supporting religious endowments. Perfect, right? Got to cl clear up what we mean there, right? So is to support religious endowments um, uh, in the form of a wealth tax known as zakat. Zakat. Let me move this over so we can see a little bit better. Um, so uh, in particular, do, 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 this reflects the fact that the fact that the origins of well, I shouldn't say um, you know actually let's just go ahead and get a little context in here let's get some historical context in here uh, Islam as a religion has its origins in the trading center of the Arabian Peninsula a place where many people became rich off of trade. And therefore, the religion itself cannot condemn wealth accumulation, but encourages the distribution to alleviate suffering. of the poor. I feel like that's that's not really a stretch, although I admit that that is, to be clear, not the most nuanced take on a religious text, right? Clearly, there's probably a lot more at play in that passage. But since, again, I'm just a high school student writing a high school essay, um, <clears throat> that's about the depth of the nuance I'm going to be able to provide for that very particular um, passage. Let's see. And then finally, we have a tapestry from a Buddhist cave in Central Asia. Central Asia, so that's probably on the Silk Road. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if that is in modern-day Uzbekistan. It might be. Um, we have a tapestry from a Buddhist cave in Central Asia, which shows merchants being blessed for bringing gifts to the temple, to a... Actually, you know, this is a good question. Hang on, let's take a look. Let's go back to that document. See, this is what I mean when I say that this could be tricky because let's we, we should be careful with our languages here, right? So let's look at this. Okay, we have the tapestry. We have the merchants here. They're bringing gifts of something, wealth perhaps, right? The painting shows blessing Central Asian traders bearing gifts for the temples. Okay, so the, the traders aren't giving gifts to the Buddha himself. Why would the Buddha need gifts? He's the Buddha, he's enlightened and eternal, but the temple, right? So this is very clearly for the temple. But why? 
Oh, the cave temples. Okay, the cave temples. All right, never mind. The cave temples. Okay, okay. That's that's what we're getting at. Okay. Okay, let's switch back. Okay, that's what I mean when I say when you're writing these symptoms, you got to be careful about what you're saying. Cause like, you know, if I talked about giving gifts to the Buddha himself, that wouldn't make a lot of sense. All right. <clears throat> so, um... Shows the merchants being blessed for bringing gifts to a religious institution. Again, like with Christianity, this depiction of wealth is is blessed, literally, as long as the wealth is put towards a good cause, like the temple or other religious institutions which do holy work or good work. Right? And I should probably take this time to talk about why it is a great little, little some little context here or audience, perhaps, in some intended audience, which I haven't done yet, would be a really good idea. Or I did do intended audience the first time. The intent, the purpose. Actually, you know what? Even better. Even better. Let's do, uh, no, actually, let's take it back. Let's just do intended audience because this is easy. The intended audience of this painting was no doubt uh, merchants on the Silk Road, right? In this case, those people would have had wealth to give and Buddhism was popular among these merchants as it was not geographically limited like other religions of the Silk Road. Therefore, asking for wealth in return for blessings would be targeted at the wealthy. Whoops, let me scroll down. <clears throat> the wealthy, a.k.a. the merchants. Bada bing. Oh, wait a minute. We even got a donation. We got a donation. Speaking of wealth, how did I miss that? little thing didn't go off i was supposed to have a, a little a little ching a little timer it was supposed to notify me when someone gave money oh my goodness oh goodness wait it should say on the stream it should say who's the number one donor oh it doesn't say or is it too small hang on we're gonna we're gonna shrink we're gonna raise hmm that's so strange it's supposed to say who's a donor. It's supposed to say who's a donor. Oh, it's not working. Oh, man, I knew something was going to go up with this. Um, hang on. I just want to I want to really acknowledge. I just want to see if I can acknowledge. Uh, acknowledge who has who is donated, who is given. <laughs> Hold on. Uh, let's see. Who, who has given? Who has given? Who's helped us get to our 5% target? Um. Hmm. Well, I guess that person has chosen to remain anonymous. Well, whomever that person is, thank you. Also, 20 bucks, uh, if that person is in chat and wants to drop a personal question or someone knows that person in chat... And wants to drop a personal question. That's exactly what the, that's that's exactly what it's for. So uh, well, that's good news. That's great. Thank you so much for whomever did that. Thank you. I thank you. And uh, yeah. Okay. Bada bing, bada bing. Okay. Um, sorry. We should intended audience. I uh, a. Uh, intended audience and. Here we go. This was document. 
which was the Buddhist one. That was document six. That was document six. Five, six, four. Okay, awesome. Next paragraph. Oh, yikes. Times just keeps ticking on. Times keeps ticking on. All right, so we're going to go and talk about um, taxes being paid by merchants. Uh, states were also not opposed to wealth accumulation by individuals provided that taxes were paid provided that actually I shouldn't say that because it isn't always talking about taxes provided that <clears throat> states could profit themselves from the merchant activities from I shouldn't say the merchant activities from merchant activities cool so, for instance, the, for instance, China, since the times of the warring states, had a guarantee not to confiscate merchant wealth, right? Not to confiscate that merchant wealth, right? As is described in a letter. Right, and that's document number one. While the state, while the states, uh, while the state itself does not profit directly, according to the letter, the letter does hint that the state might benefit from the profitable markets that are mentioned in the document. Historically, states have tried to take advantage of advantage of trade routes and trade activities. This Chinese state would not be the last to do this. Most famously, the Mongols, or I should say the Mongol Empire, protected merchants on the Silk Road. Right, most famously, the Mongol Empire protected merchants on the Silk Road in order to tax the profits of their economic activity only confirming that states are not opposed to wealth accumulation cool perhaps through let's just clarify that perhaps through taxes Cool. All right. Uh, da, 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 that's our outside evidence right there. It's our evidence beyond the documents. Awesome possum. Which, if you were to ever see this NSA like this one again, the Mongols are always a great source of outside information for, for many, many uh, essays. Um, this can also be seen in an edict from a South... A South... Asian ruler who agreed not to confiscate goods in return for a set tax. This represents a a let's have the this represents a system by which the state will not use its power to confiscate all wealth but rather only take a small amount in order to be able to take more in the future right so in other words a steady taxation base right so a steady taxation base instead of an outright confiscation, right? 
So again, there's not opposition. This is document seven, by the way. So not opposition, but just be like, hey, look, you know, we you pay a little bit now, and you pay a little bit next time, and we'll promise not to take all your stuff, right? Because I could do it. I'm the king, right? I am powerful. I have the right to confiscate all your stuff. But I'm not going to do that as long as you just pay a small tax, and we'll work together, right? The long history of the uh, state in the economy is, uh, is a very big part of human history. Almost every state has attempted in some ways to benefit from that economic activity. Those that don't try to do that tend to not last very long. Uh, you have very few hostile, merchant hostile states in history. Dope, dope. Okay, um, <clears throat> where were we? All right, we still got to talk about uh, that subtle difference, right? The main difference in state versus religious responses to wealth accumulation come in the form of excess, come in the form of how much wealth can be accumulated, right? Uh, comes in the form of how much wealth can be accumulated. While religions do not put any sort of cap or limit on wealth, um, while religions don't put any sort of cap or limit on wealth, states have sometimes attempted to do so or to dissuade its people from accumulating wealth. So for example, so for example, the Roman Empire attempted to prevent an, or I should say the Roman Empire, um, one Roman statesman compared merchants and money lenders to murderers. That's a, that's a bit of a humorous comparison. <laughs> merchants and money lenders to murderers. This comparison was done in an attempt to appeal to the right or correct ways of building wealth which was agriculture however in the roman empire only the families with lots of land and slaves managed to acquire wealth in such a manner meaning for most Romans, this would keep them in a lower economic class. That's a little bit of context, a little bit of complexity in there. I'm not going to go so far as to say it's a hip statement, but um, I think it certainly comes a bit close to it, right? It, it definitely would add to that complexity point. All right, so... Um, da, 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 da. All right, so that's... Uh, that's document three. Right, that's document three, yes. Let's consult my notes real quick. Um, yes, that is document three. That is document three. And last but not least, um, a less extreme example would be the Mauryan Empire's policies of fixed profits and the superintendent of commerce, the superintendent, not just a regular intendant, he's a superintendent of commerce. Now he's a superintendent of commerce. This, uh, this policy of allowing fixed profits 
<clears throat> ensures that no merchant becomes too wealthy or powerful and represents the state's attempt to limit wealth accumulation. I think we'll do context here. Uh, in particular, this was written when the Mauryan Empire was young, was a young state, and may have been intended to prevent the rise of a wealthy merchant class, which could threaten the political class. Now, of course, that's conjecture. Uh, I have no idea if that's really the case. Um, um, but that's kind of the arguments that you can make uh, when you're doing these essays. Just, you know, if it's something you could infer, possibly, then you can make the case, right? Um, and I think this is a reasonable historical uh, guess. Now, obviously, again, I'm not a PhD. This isn't a PhD paper. This is just uh, something a student might think of when they are uh, writing these essays, right? They may not know that this is the early Mauryan Empire. Um, but, you know, it's always possible. New political class. Um, so that would be context. Political class and... Actually, here, hang on. Later, these policies might have been lifted after the state was more secure. Cool. Okay. Now, one of the things I've kind of realized as I've been writing this is that we really could have probably combined paragraphs two and three. Um, we could just kind of brought them together. Uh, they didn't necessarily have to be separate. For me, just in my head, it was a little bit easier to uh, just kind of separate them, which is fine if that's what you uh, uh, want to do, uh, if you want to keep them separate in your head. But uh, it, it, they really could have just been separate. They didn't necessarily need to uh, be uh, one. So let's see. Describe three documents. Support seven of them. Uh, we got a thesis. Uh, we got three hip statements. I think we have enough uh, complexity in there. Um, we've pointed out, um, let's see, the, the subtle difference between, um, actually, you know what we can do to add a little bit more complexity, right? Um, Zakat is institutionalized. Um, this is an interesting difference because this passage from the document focuses on giving to individuals not institutions such as in document uh, four and six Yet even here, and charity must be structured to make sure it gets to those who need it. Must be structured by religious leaders. There we go. That's a bit of nuance there. We can just put that in there. Cool. Um, 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 oh, right. We don't have a context statement. We got to get, we got to contextualize all this. Okay. Contextualizing. That's right. I thought I was done. I thought I finished with 10 minutes to go. I did not. <clears throat> I did not. Um, okay. Um, contextualizing. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's see. Let's start really broad. Let's go back really far. So 
some of the earliest i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm just going full documentary mode here i'm sorry if this is this is gonna we're, we're departing from what i think the average student might be able to know i'm go, we're just going full documentary here i apologize promise i won't do this again some of the earliest known records in human history are those of taxes and financial transactions which is true I was, it's, it's, it, that's exactly what we know about it, the ancient world, financial transactions and taxes. Um, this reflects the long concern with the long concern of states and probably religious leaders with the question of wealth accumulation. From ancient Mesopotamia, from ancient Mesopotamia to the empires of the classical age, such as Alexander the Great, <clears throat> states and states have attempted to both benefit and limit the power of the wealthy. The rise of classical religions brought another dimension to this control in the form of giving to those less fortunate. So there we go. That's that's I will fully admit that that's probably not something a student would come up with. What a student would probably do in this case is a student would probably come up with a list of empires and how they rose in the time period prior to 600 BC. They might talk about like the rise of states, which you could do, and that would count. Um, I'm just kind of going full documentary mode here, um, just because I kind of feel like it. Um, but okay, uh, let's see. Doop, 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 doop. I think we have everything here. Document number four. Let's see. State versus religious response to wealth accumulation. Okay, got it, all right. Okay, so that's four down with five to go. 